All right. Uh, let me see if I have everything set up. Okay. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm delighted to continue our series on Romantic Manifesto by Ayn Rand. Today, we're gonna to be talking about what is romanticism. And it's always a delight to have Rob, Marisa, Joya, and Sherry uh, talking about this. So take it away, folks. Rob. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, all right, so we're doing the chapter today on what is romanticism. And one of the things that comes out in this chapter uh, a lot, and it's throughout the book, but it's just particularly in this chapter, is talking about, the, she has this idea that romanticism is sort of unknown and ignored and disparaged. And that was really quite true of the sort of highbrow literary world of roughly the 50s and 60s. And, you know, Joseph Heller and all these sort of novelists who'd write these long novels about, you know, the, the, the lives of quiet desperation led by repressed middle managers and you read a 500, 400 page novel and nothing ever really happens in it. Actually, there was a book called, uh, a Joseph Heller book I read when I was young called uh, Something Happened. <laughs> and the most ironic title ever because <laughs> in the entire book, nothing ever really happens, right? <laughs> something happened, you know, basically the, the title refers to something happened in his life prior to the events that we get in the novel that somehow caused it all to go wrong and he doesn't really know why and he doesn't know what happened or where and it's just it's fog and nothing ever happens in the entire in the entire book so that was a very 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 much the standard highbrow literary novel of of her time but i think it's kind of ironic in a way that she's saying that whilst reading it now and i think specifically when i think of it when i came across it because you know, in a later, in a later chapter, one, the introduction to 93, she talks about how she has this line there that says, Victor Hugo is virtually unknown in America today. <laughs> well, by the time I got to this, that, that had changed very dramatically. And I think still has because, you know, in 1985, Les Miserables came out as a musical, took the world by storm. And now Victor Hugo is kind of a, 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 a household name. Uh, to some made a movie. Yeah, I mean, well, they've done Hunchback of Notre Dame before. It, it has little to do with the actual That's true. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, the, the Miserab is fairly, is, is so well known. It's put Victor Hugo uh, sort of in, in people's ears. People know who he is. It makes the whole uh, history of romanticism, literary romanticism, much more accessible, I think, to a modern audience than it perhaps was when she was writing this. Uh, and the other thing I can't help pointing out, the other thing that happened in 1985. So I just got this in the mail for my kids, but you see this, this is the Back to the Future trilogy. And it seems worth mentioning, it also came out in 85, 86, somewhere in there. Um, it's worth mentioning in the context specifically of this chapter, because the whole point she says here is that the, the essence of romanticism is the portrayal of human volition. And for those who know the Back to the Future films, I probably don't have to belabor it. Spoiler! <laughs> Every, like everybody knows the Back <laughs> to the Future films. You'll know that the idea of volition, of somebody making a different choice and changing the future, that is you know, the central theme of all three of the films in this, in this trilogy that was done. So uh, again, another thing where that's, you know, that issue has come, is more accessible perhaps in the culture uh, than it was at the time she wrote this. Uh, but the thing that really I wanted to talk about is her uh, discussion of romanticism, because this is, you know, we're a little over halfway through the, mm -hmm. through the book at this point, and it's called The Romantic Manifesto. And we haven't really talked about romanticism yet. Uh, so we've talked a lot about the psychoepistemological function of art, art as a concretization of metaphysics. We've talked about how that relates to all the different branches of art, to music, and, and you know, we've gone over that in a lot of detail we haven't really gotten to the definition of uh, what is romanticism. We're talking about romanticism proper. And one of the things I find fascinating about this is that Ayn Rand's definition of romanticism that she gives here is a very specific distillation of what was historically a very, I mean, she, she acknowledges that historically a very diffuse and confusing a mass of different things. And I think Sherry's going to talk a little bit about some of this in the other arts outside of literature. But I wanted to read, I thought it was a very good summary. This is, I think, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has a very good summary of romanticism as a movement. It's a, it's, they described it as an attitude or intellectual orientation. 
And uh, so romanticism can be seen as rejection of the precepts of order, calm, harmony, balance, idealization, and rationality that typified classicism in general and late 18th century neoclassicism in particular. It was also to some extent a reaction against the enlightenment and against 18th century rationalism and physical materialism in general. Romanticism emphasized the individual, the subjective, the irrational, the imaginative, the personal, the spontaneous, the emotional, the visionary, and the transcendental. And let's see. Uh, um, here. Among the characteristic attitudes of Romanticism were the following, a deepened appreciation of the beauties of nature, a general exaltation of emotion over reason and of the senses over intellect, a turning in upon, upon the self and a heightened examination of human personality and its moods and mental potentialities, a preoccupation with the genius, the hero, and the exceptional figure in general, and a focus on his or her passions and inner struggles. A new view of the artist as a supremely individual creator whose creative spirit is more important than strict adherence to formal rules and traditional procedures. And then it goes on a little bit more, it talks about the fascination of the medieval era uh, and a fascination with the exotic, the remote, the mysterious, the weird, the occult, the monstrous, the disease, and even the satanic. I love that list. <laughs> All right, so the odd thing you can see in there is if you look at that, and I think this is not a highly inaccurate, this is not an inaccurate, this is an accurate summary of the romantic movement as a whole because it had all those different elements. But if you look in there, what you can see from the perspective of reading about this for Ayn Rand is in amongst the irrational, there's also the individual and the heroic and the idea of the artist as a creator, as an, as an individualistic creator, a genius and an exceptional figure and the idea of uh, somebody who could break the rule, who can come up with new rules and doesn't have to, and can be innovative and break out of the old forms. So there's all sorts of stuff that you know Ayn Rand would like, mixed in with all sorts of stuff that's the exact opposite of what she was advocating, because she was a great advocate of reason. And so when she defines romanticism in here, now one thing that we're going to talk about later is she defines it in literary terms, in terms of the novel, right? So. She's not trying to define romanticism in here in broader terms, in terms of the whole romantic movement in poetry and music and, and, and you know, sculpture and painting, et cetera. Uh, but when she defines it, even when she defines it in regard to literature, this definition is almost sort of, I don't wanna say it's wishful thinking, but it's, it's her trying to sort of bring order out of this chaos and bring a very specific conception of what romanticism is and what it requires that is much more ordered <laughs> and specific and well-defined than the actual historical romantic movement, which was this you know, very, very purposely chaotic uh, mixture of, of, of oftentimes opposite ideals. And I think that's actually, so what I'm gonna talk about is that how that reflects something about her philosophy as a whole. Uh, and I actually, so I'm going to quote myself a little bit here because I wrote in, I, sorry, I, I wrote a book on Atlas Shrugged. I got a whole chapter, chapter 17, where I talk about Ayn Rand as an enlightenment philosopher, but also talk about why people often don't see that. And we're going to get to that in a second, but um, about how Ayn Rand fits in with the ideal, philosophical ideas of the enlightenment. And uh, so I, I, I have a section here where I quote from Isaac Kramnik, who's written a, a book called the, it's, it's called The Enlightenment Reader. And it's like, if you go out to get a standard thing of like, what, what did the figures of enlightenment have to say? This is one of your standard reference books. It's a collection of different things, you know, by Diderot and Voltaire and all these different enlightenment philosophers all gathered together. And he has an introduction where he kind of sums up the common themes. So see if any of this, these enlightenment, the themes of the enlightenment philosophers, see if any of this sounds familiar. Quote, they believed that unassisted human reason, not faith or tradition, was the principal guide to human conduct. Well, check. Everything, including political and religious authority, must be subject to a critique of reason if it were to commend itself to the respect of humanity. Check. Humanity was not innately corrupt as Catholicism taught, nor was the good life found only in a beatific state of otherworldly salvation. Check. Pleasure and happiness were worthy ends of life and realizable in this world. Check. The natural universe governed by the governed not by the miraculous whimsy of a supernatural God, 
was ruled by rational scientific laws, which were accessible to human beings through the scientific method of experiment and empirical observation. Check. And final, uh, science and technology were the engines of progress, enabling modern men and women to force nature to serve their well being and further their happiness. Check. The Enlightenment valorized the individual and the moral legitimacy of self interest. Well, double check. You know, if we're talking about Ayn Rand. So, the, you know, this is like his one paragraph summary of all the basic themes of the Enlightenment. And every single item in there, we can go check, 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 check. Totally Ayn Rand, you know, Ayn Rand's philosophy is the total embodiment of all this. So Ayn Rand was absolutely an Enlightenment philosopher. Now, there's been a lot of attention to the Enlightenment recently, and I talked about this, that um, uh, a lot of attention to, there, there are a, couple, a couple of years ago, there, uh, about the time I was writing this, there were a couple of books that came out. So Stephen Pinker had a book called Enlightenment Now, and um, Jonah Goldberg, sort of coming more from the center right, had a book called uh, the, the Miracle or something like that. Oh, well, it's, I quoted it in here, so I'm trying to remember what it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, so it's called Suicide of the West. So he yeah, had a very depressing title, but it's actually about the legacy of the Enlightenment. So they're both sort of defending the legacy of the Enlightenment and bemoaning the fact that, you know, this wonderful Enlightenment ideals that came and they brought so much good to the world, but people passed away from them and moved away from them. And the uh, argument, the, the way they sum it up, let me see, I have it in here. Uh, it is generally conceded that the backlash to the Enlightenment, the fiery emotionalism of the Romantic era produced a more stirring artistic vision. And that has been a matter of concern for recent defenders of the Enlightenment who worry that the value of Enlightenment ideals has been overshadowed by the seductive literary appeal of Romanticism. And the examples I give here are things, are exactly the sort of things we're talking about, you know, the emphasis on heroism, the emphasis on strong emotion, uh, on authentic personal feelings, uh, and uh, and all the things that, that were part of that list, you know, in amongst the attack and reason, there's all these other things that were very de very desirable. But when we read that other list of the emphasis on heroism, uh, the emphasis on the individual, uh, the emphasis on dramatic events and strong feelings, that's also something we associate with Ayn Rand. So we have a list of here's all the Enlightenment ideals, and then here's all the things that the Romantics did in art that were seen as a backlash to those Enlightenment ideals. And here Ayn Rand is as somebody who embodies one and embodies the other at the same time. And I think that's what's really interesting about this chapter in particular of this book as, a, as an example of that overall pattern that what Ayn Rand was really doing, she never quite put it in these terms, but what she was doing is basically taking the I, basic philosophic ideas or aspirations of the Enlightenment and combining them with the artistic style and appeal of the Romantic era. Uh, so what I, I I quote that her I quote a comment that she made about Nietzsche because you know she's often seen I, I mentioned that you know in his book uh, defending the Enlightenment Stephen Pinker writes off Ayn Rand as a Nietzschean, right? And if you know anything about Nietzsche's philosophy and Ayn Rand's philosophy, it's not true at all. They're, they're diametrically opposite on a bunch of key issues. But the reason he does that is because her style is very romantic. It's very powerful and emotional and, and uh, the emphasis on heroism and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I quoted what Ayn Rand herself had to say about Nietzsche. She says, philosophically, Nietzsche is a mystic and an irrationalist. His metaphysics consists of a somewhat Byronic and, and mystically malevolent universe. His epistemology subordinates reason to will or feeling or instinct or blood or innate virtues of character. If she has a lot of ors there, it's because you know Nietzsche was one of these philosophers who gives you a long multiple choice list of what he actually believes. Uh, but as a poet, he projects at times, not consistently, a magnificent feeling for man's greatness expressed in emotional, not intellectual terms. And that thing of you know, the idea of romanticism as, as projecting a feeling for man's greatness in emotional, but not intellectual terms really sums up you know, what she's going at in this chapter here. So I put it, as I put it in my book, what Ayn Rand took for the Romantics was a sense of life expressed in emotional terms for which she provided her own intellectual terms. Uh, those terms were diametrically opposed to romanticism, romanticism as a school of philosophy, yet she was clearly part of the Romantic tradition as a school of literature. So she's essentially trying to give, take all the glamor and excitement and po emotional power and appeal of Romanticism and combine it with the basic ideas of the Enlightenment. 
And I think you can see this idea of saying, taking something that's expressed in emotional terms and then bringing her own intellectual terms to it. Uh, I can see it in one passage in here in particular that caused my eyebrows to raise up. And this is in the chapter, What is Romanticism? This is That's like, the one we're reading this week. Yeah, it's about three pages in. She says, art is the product of a man's subconscious integrations of his sense of life to a larger extent than of his conscious philosophical convictions. And this is our explanation basically for why the romantic uh, uh, authors that she's referring to, people like Victor Hugo, had such a confusing hash of contrad often contradictory or vague ideas and often ideas that were totally opposite of hers in, in terms of explicit in, in explicit philosophical terms, they were often ideas that were opposite of hers. But she's basically in this chapter saying, but you know, implicitly in there and on the subconscious level, they are relying on my ideas about you know, reason and volition and the power of the individual. And here, let me explain how that's the real essence of romanticism as a school of literature. So in a way she's you know, sort of like imposing her, her own philosophical framework onto this very confused and, and diffuse romantic movement. But I think what she's, the way she's approaching it, she's basically saying that implicitly, you know, in terms of their explicit ideas, they were hashed, they were a mess, they were all over the place. But implicitly, if you go behind what is actually required to achieve this sense of drama and heroism and uh, the power of the individual, then you're going to require these rational ideas that, that, that she's provided to you. And that's like a microcosm of her overall relationship to the Enlightenment and to the Romantic era, as she is the person trying to bridge those two or, or integrate those two and take all the ideas of the enlightenment and give and make them compatible with all the emotional power and artistic uh, achievement of the romantic movement. And this is really the central chapter of the book where she, where she does that. Wow, wow. amazing. Uh, th thank you, Rob, that, that, was, that was just uh, brilliant, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Marisa. Oh man, I should have opted to go different in order. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go after that. Um, you know what? I'm gonna cheat. Um, since you you we we brought up Star Trek for a minute and sure. earlier, I'm gonna bring it up again. So, well, actually, Gene Roddenberry. So, um, just for funsies, to you guys, I actually have not watched a series called um, Andromeda. But in some of my research that I was doing for um, Star Trek, yes, I've been doing research for Star Trek. It actually sounds funny to say that out loud. But as I was, I found it annotated that. Ayn Rand was a fan of Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry was a fan of Ayn Rand. And actually in Andromeda, there is a colony called the Ayn Rand Station. And it's founded by a species, species called the Nietzscheans. <laughs> right? Okay, so now that I've dumbed it down a little bit, now I can you know, go back to what we're actually here to discuss. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so in the last, section of this chapter, Ayn Rand um, tells us, what is certain, however, is that every aspect of Western culture needs a new code of ethics, a rational ethics, as a precondition of rebirth. You know, this book is pretty old, but I feel that that statement is almost more applicable today than it was when she wrote it. And her call for the necessity of romantic art as she describes it, which Ron did a, uh, Rob, Rob, sorry, did a fantastic job of explaining to us, this sentence is like the reason for her plea, as it were. And that's what I feel this book is, it's a, it's a long continual plea to return to something that gives us substance. You know, Ayn Rand in this chapter, she, she clarifies for us that whereas Romanticism in general suffered from a little bit of an identity crisis, she clearly states that it, it stems most importantly from a basis of morality, of values values first, and then we consider emotions. You can't separate the two, which is why she believes that, you know, it was a little convoluted in um, its day. And she believes 
And this chapter really does point out to us that with every fiber of her being, she believes that we are a people bereft of enough material to give us guiding principles for our morality and values. And that's what I hear when I, when I read this sentence. And honestly, when I read the sentence, it's like, you know, it could have been written yesterday and, and been so, so material to today's world. So it's fascinating that this was written so long ago and it's still so pertinent. Um, you know, the, um, the concept of volition is what she, you know, she, she brings out and in her mind, you know, you, one does have to choose one values. And um, she, she looks at it to us where our, our volition or human volition as it were, operates in respect to two primary aspects. You have consciousness and you have existence. And she tells us that the consciousness aspect is psychological act, action. Existence is like physical action. And she says, Consciousness is the choices we exercise with regards to our own internal psychological life, how we form our character. And this is not a direct quote of hers, it's kind of my interpretation. Um, and for existence, you know, she says existence is more the physical action and that's choices we make in our actual physical action as we navigate through this world. Consciousness would be, if we're gonna tie it in to the previous um, lecture on looking at literature, the previous chapter, sorry, looking at literature, characterization would encompass consciousness and plot would encompass the existence. And, and she focuses a lot of this chapter on those two, most, mostly on plot, but she does come into characterization and um, you know how plot is a purposeful progression of logically connected events that are leading to a resolution of a, com uh, of a climax. Interestingly enough, she does state that it's not, uh, there's not always a plot necessary. It's an interesting caveat because her book Anthem, by her own admission in, in listening to some of her radio um, interviews, Anthem doesn't actually have a plot, but she still considers it to be a work of romanticism by her definition, because there is a, you know, there, there's still a presentation of leading you towards a perceived morality as it were. Um, and and I, I, I feel like she says so much and she, she really does spend a lot of time saying this, not that, but ultimately what she's pointing out to us is that when you, when you look at some work of art, whether it be literature or art or music, does it speak to you? Because if it's speaking to you, most likely it's because it's invoking something in you. And in so doing, it's pointing out a set of, I'm gonna say steps as it were, but maybe steps is the wrong word. I'm not entirely certain the right word here, but what I get that she's telling us is that we need more artwork that does not shy away from providing us with a guiding light, as it were. Like there's too much fluff out there basically is what she's telling us to, to frankly, just to make it you know, simple. I, I, I will say that I am fascinated by the people that Ayn Rand found to be interesting or like, for example, um, Mickey Spillane is, now I, I actually will admit, I don't know as much about him. I believe he is attributed with the comics. Um, you know, he's, he, he had something to do with some of the, the initial writings of, you know, Superman. So I think it's Marvel comics. This is not my area of expertise. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was the Marvel comics that Mickey Spillane was in. And when I, heard that this was somebody she, he's actually, when she's at, when she was asked a direct question in one of the interviews, who was her favorite um, author? That's who she said, Mickey Spillane. So naturally I had to go and look him up. And it's the, 
it goes back to her belief in art providing to us a vision of what could be. When I, when I look at the people that she views as being included in the, her definition of romanticism, that's what it is. It's not, and she points out people whose philosophy she does not agree with. So it's, it's not that divisive, but it's fascinating to see that the one characteristic that remains the same for all of them is that every one of these authors is providing us a potential vision of what could be like um, in, in Les, Les Miserables for Victor Hugo, it, it's, you can dissect each of the characters. And if you felt so inclined, you could envision yourself in every scenario. And, and even if you should say, like out of instinct, you would say, oh, that would never be me. The way in which it's presented is enough to give you pause and wonder, or could it? Like the level to which, I mean, I, I'm, these are gonna be spoilers, but I'm, I'm going on the assumption that most people have besides, you know, Rob gave us homework. So we're gonna assume everybody, everybody watched Limits, right? So, um, a, you know, a, the, there, the one of the first, we're first presented with a, a protagonist who is so desperate that she would sell her own hair and teeth. And you're like, well, that's never gonna be me. But as you read the story, it never occurs to you that's never gonna be me. Like it's presented in such a manner that it, it you are, em, you are feeling this vast amount of empathy for someone who in that time period would have been considered the lowest of the low because she does become, she becomes this very low, you know, very low prostitute as it were. But the, the, the way in which the story is depicted, it's showing you the choices that she makes. And, and I, I think there's a, there's a statement in there that, you know, talks about how, you know, she did it wrong. She, she decided to sell herself again after she sold her hair and her teeth. And, and it's interesting to me because it's like, that seems like a silly, almost funny thought, but that's a point of choice. She was trying to hold on to a perceived moral value that she had of not selling herself her body. And, as, and because of that, she sold her hair, she sold her teeth, she saw those as the lesser of two evils. But after having done that, she felt that since she had done that, why not also her body? And that seems like not something that is a huge deal, but when you really think about it, the fact that the author has presented it in a manner that allows you to see that she may have fared better had she done it in the reverse is fascinating. And, and the, the very fact that it may have been an entirely different story had she in fact done that. And you wonder why the author put it in that way because it also feels certain to me at the end of it and at the end of the story that it was purposefully presented in that way because what he was trying to show us is that we all make poor choices and we too can find ourselves in some situation that seems to us not of our doing because you know even in the end she was she was blaming and cursing um Jean Valjean for this you know being her fate she didn't actually seem to own up to it initially when when she was um being arrested and and that's, it just seems to me that Ayn Rand is telling us that we need more stories that do that, that have so many intricate layers. And, but every time you peel back a layer, you're asking yourself a question that is touching upon a morality of yours. Now, now how we perceive the morality, that's personal and it's not gonna be the same and it's not dictated by the author, 
But what I view when, when answering the question, what is romanticism? Ayn Rand is telling us romanticism is providing us a viewing of our morality and of volition for the human population in general. Thanks. Thanks, Marisa. I mean, I really liked how you kind of talked about how, you know, what, what does romanticism do for you and what kind of crucial role it plays for you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Joya. Joya, go ahead. I wanna say I love where I am in this lineup <laughs> because I love that I get to follow Rob who gave us such a, a, a wonderful analysis of the history of the era of romanticism, how this connects to the enlightenment. And then we have Maritza who talked about the plea for the rebirth and, and what the relevance of romanticism can be for the present and the future. So I hope that what I can do can maybe even start to connect some of the dots and, and put some of all of this together. I wanna share what I find most fascinating about this chapter is what I regard as Ayn Rand's really unique perspective on what romanticism is and could be. I come from this from the perspective, people who know me probably know that I spent many years in graduate school in English and American literature studying the history of romanticism. So I can tell you when you study romanticism in literature, uh, especially in English and American literature, one of the first things you learn is that it's, it's impossible to define what romanticism is. And, and we kind of even saw that in what Rob was presenting to us, that we understand that romanticism was this certain time period. And it starts in the late 18th, early 19th century in, in Britain and in Germany, that, that's sort of the early uh, 1800s is, is when it's starting there. And, and because in academia, they kind of divide this up by languages. So when you're studying English romanticism, primarily you're studying poets. You're studying Keats and Shelley and Byron and Wordsworth and Coleridge. And then sometimes you study a little bit of Frankenstein. You know, there, there's your monstrous image. Um, so it starts there. Then, you know, it starts to spread out through Europe. Uh, you know, in, we're talking about Victor Hugo. It doesn't get to France until the, the middle of the 19th century. And then American romanticism is often equated with uh, the transcendental movement. So you're reading reading Hawthorne and Rand mentions, but you're reading Emerson and Thoreau and Edgar Allan Poe and, and maybe Melville and Moby Dick, sometimes Emily Dickinson uh, kind of gets thrown in there. And even as I'm mentioning all these authors, you can probably we see that, that not all of these authors have the same interests. So there are these recurring themes of imagination and focus on the individual and subjective experience and interest in nature and interest in medievalism. And there is this response to, you know, there, there is a way in which they're, they're responding against uh, classicism and, and certain enlightenment values perhaps. But what I see as being really interesting is that Ayn Rand is looking at this giant conglomerate and finding something that is incredibly valuable to her. And one of the things I think that's really interesting about her perspective is she's obviously writing this now in the mid 20th century, knowing that that what comes after romanticism is naturalism, which of course none of the romantics could have known that they were gonna be followed by the schools of, of realism and naturalism coming after them. And that what Ayn Rand identifies that's crucial to her philosophy and that what she sees represented in certain of these romantic authors that she admires is this focus on volition and she's paying attention to the authors where she really sees that this, this comes out. And I think it is really interesting to notice that as opposed to classicism before it or naturalism after it, that the romanticism is where even on this subconscious level, as Rob was pointing out, there could be this, this aspect of volition. And, and even what Maritza was telling us about how we could look at a character like Fantine and think about what are the choices that this character is making. And so I wanted to share a passage from, from this chapter that I think really gets to the heart of Ayn Rand's unique perspective on what romanticism is and could be. Um, so she says, what the romanticists brought to art was the privacy of values, an element that had been missing in the stale, arid, third and fourth hand and rate repetitions of the classicist's formula copy. Values and value judgments are the source of emotions. 
A great deal of emotional intensity was projected in the work of the romanticists and in the reactions of their audiences, as well as a great deal of color, imagination, originality, excitement, and all the other consequences of a value-oriented view of life. This emotional element was the most easily perceivable characteristic of the new movement, and it was taken as its defining characteristic without deeper inquiry. Such issues as the fact that the primacy of values in human life is not an irreducible primary, that it rests on man's faculty of volition, and therefore that the romanticists philosophically were the champions of volition, which is the root of values, and not of emotions, which are merely the consequences, were issues to be defined by philosophers who defaulted in regard to aesthetics as they did in regard to every other crucial aspect of the 19th century. The still deeper issue the fact that the faculty of reason is the faculty of volition was not known at the time and the various theories of free will for, were for the most part of an anti-rational character, thus reinforcing the association of volition with mysticism. But to me, this is the really interesting through line where we can see what romanticism is and can be, that, that through this focus on the hero and individualism and the excitement, uh, and I wanted to link this too to something we were talking about in the, the last discussion when we were talking about her analysis of literature and, and her view of what really distinguishes a good novel is a focus on plot and that there has to be conflict, conflict of values. And, and then there's the same idea of there, there's choice and values and the conflict between the characters that's going to drive the plot and give rise to a plot theme, uh, an integration between the, the actual actions that the characters are pursuing and the broader, uh, more abstract intellectual or philosophical ideas that the work of art is expressing. And what I love here is we see that what Ayn Rand's view of romanticism is, is this integration of emotion with reason through the, the faculty of volition. And I wanted to end by even coming back to what Maritza was, was suggesting to us of, of how relevant this could be. This book is the Romantic Manifesto. And, and to point that out that I think, you know, Ayn Rand really is calling for a, a rebirth of a, of a new, way of doing art and what kind of possibility this could be for us and for the future that could recognize this this kind of integration and this perspective that she brings wow uh joya that was that was amazing i mean my my mind has so many things and what we'll do is after sherry uh let's try to map out these things because you know all of you put you know put down we are looking at history of art and approaches to it, you know, views of reason, uh, emotion, values, volition, approach towards existing systems versus new things individuals can do. And I want to try to map out all of these things. Um, so Sherry, you're next. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, um, I always love, uh, we don't, the four of us don't plan ahead of time exactly who's going to talk about what. And we, it's, it turns out quite often that it, it's this really wonderful natural flow from one to the other. So Joya, thanks for the perfect pitch right down the middle. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, my background isn't um, as much in, um, in literature. I have some background in it. Um, I, I would love to learn more and to read more widely, but my background's especially in the visual arts and in architecture, somewhat in music, not mm -hmm. nearly as much. Um, but so with what Rob talked about at the beginning, um, kind of explaining um, the historical context where, she, where Ayn Rand is coming in on this, there's one um, paragraph in this chapter that really hits me as the art and architectural historian, um, which is, this. It's um, my copy is this copy, page 160, oh, excuse me, 104, uh, last full paragraph, um, second sentence. Romanticism declared it is to be an aesthetic school based on the primacy of emotion as against the champions of primacy of reason, which were the classicist and later the naturalist. In various forms, this definition has persisted to our day. 
It is an example of the intellectually dis disastrous consequences of definitions by non-essentials. And I'm going to show you a little bit. We're going to pull up some visual images to kind of show you in the visual arts um, some of where this trans transition happens. Um, but it's really important to remember um, what is considered romanticism versus classicism versus naturalism in literature is slightly different than it is in music and architecture and the visual arts. Um, but the way that they're defined in um, the historical context is really by this definition of the non-essential. Um, and it's just because they're kind of trying to grab bag, put book ends around things. Um, and as Rob points out at the beginning of his discussion here, what she's really calling for is pulling the correct, the, the essential element of each, putting the reason and the emotion connected as it should be. Um, and so I was thinking it would be really fun to um, show you some examples of some, I decided we talked about this, about doing music or, or architecture or sculpture or painting. It decided to be easiest if we just pick one of those. Well, we said it would take an hour and a half. It'd take an hour and a half of the way. So we're going to do yeah. mostly paintings. There's a couple of pieces of architecture I'll throw in for uh, little streets at the end. Um, but what I want to do is show you a progression in a couple of different paintings. We're not going to dig, dig through them in a great detail, but um, uh, uh, some level of detail so that you can see uh, what puts a painting in each of these categories. And some of these paintings will really have a foot in both camps. And so you see some of that transition. Um, so we are gonna screen share. Um, you have these all pulled up, Rob? You're gonna, yeah. you're gonna pull for, for me, right? Uh, just go to screen Safari. share, okay. And share that and then we're gonna go. We're sort of in Zoom and Safari. It's oops, wait, 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 wait. There we go. The Safari bar is in the way. So I'm going to start all the way over here. Okay. So this first one, most of you probably have seen. I don't know. I don't know what everybody's background in yeah. art in architectural history. This is uh, the painting "Oath of the Horatii" by Jean Louis David, and it's from 1786. Um, this is. I think a transition, but David was really considered a classicist. Um, and what they meant in painting, being a classicist, meant that you were trained in the methods of depicting the human form, um, rendering it properly, understanding the, the way the body is shaped in a painting or sculpture, you would learn um, shadow and color rendering, foreshortening, all these little technical details, but then you'd also learn um, some compositional st uh, standards. Um, but in the classical period, you had kind of, an, uh, you, you had a grab bag of, you had a, a set of rules, a rule book you needed to follow which were if you wanted to be a high level painter, you needed to present your work depicting a historical um, story uh, or a historical scene of some sort, as you can see here. Or Actually, the, this, is, this, this is sort of a combination of myth and history. Yeah, or mythical. Um, uh, it could be based on a, uh, on a work of a previous work of literature um, that was quite often happened. In this particular case, um, I think you're seeing a little step in the direction to uh, romanticism in the, uh, the, the dramatic color rendering in the shadow in the bright light where the, sh the light is showing you the most important thing to look at. Um, you have the lamenting women on the side. Um, there is a bit of this appeal to the heroicism of the moment. Um, all of these things, I think, are starting to take you in the direction of romanticism, but at the same time, you still have a foot in classicism. 
right? It, it, this was 1786, so this was a, a Roman myth reinterpreted for the era of the French Revolution. Yeah, and we decided against showing you the close up of the four male figures um, when my boys had to create for their art assignment to recreate a painting. So uh, there's Rob and in the very, no, Rob was in the, in the middle, middle, the gold helmet, Grandpa Bob here holding up all the swords, <laughs> Walter in the front and little Oscar in the back by the columns. But anyway, we decided to skip that one. <laughs> Um, but it then it exists. Um, the next one we're going to show, are they all in order? Yeah. The next one we're going to show here is a self-portrait. This is um, the painter Le Brun, um, 1790, um, a female painter of quite uh, successful in her lifetime. Um, you can see here that classical side um, a little bit more where in the last painting, the Oath of Horatia, you had this dramatic striking light. Here, this is more of an even light, which was much more common in the classical period, where the even light was, it was at the time, you see it in architecture of the time too, it was seen as more reason oriented, where, um, that you could understand either everything in the painting or everything in the building because it wasn't shrouded in bright light and dark shadow and it wasn't moody, you know. Um, so here's an example of a self-portrait where you have this lovely woman, woman standing, she's painting, you can see all of her tools right there. She's got this nice even light so you have a really good understanding of the features of her face. She's very understandable um, and she's in the very calm, you know, self-possessed poise, uh, uh, pose. Um, and uh, she's, she's, she's not distraught. She's just happily there doing her thing. So when we step into the um, romanticism side of self-portrait, now we're gonna jump quite a number of years. I think it's about a hundred years. We're jumping 50, 50 years. years. We're jumping 50 years. This is what a self-portrait becomes. <laughs> now, here we have um, Gustave Courbet. Um, this is a self-portrait from 1843. And you can really hear that description Rob was explaining from the beginning of this creative genius, this internal struggle of the artist, of primacy of emotion and, and and this immediate urging drama. And you've got this massive amount of chiaroscuro, bright light and deep shadow happening. Um, this very manic expressive in his eyes. It's a little uncomfortable to stand in front of and look <laughs> at this. And then this is actually a fairly large painting too. So when you come across this, I mean, if it were me, I'd be backing up, <laughs> you know, stepping off to the side. The other one, I want to come and, and, and maybe have a lovely conversation with her. This one, I want to, I want to get out across, of the, across across the, the street, street yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure he's not following me, that sort of thing. So this is where you can see that um, this is a painting that's in that very much manic, emotional state that's what this is all about. But then you can look carefully and you see the structure of the, the understanding of the human form, the way that it's painted. And this really has a three-dimensional aspect to it. Um, so you can see some of those skills from that were so ingrained in the classical schools are still working their way through. So, then we're going to go to um, a lands, well, not a landscape, I guess it's a seascape painting. We've talked about this one before. This is the Raft of the Medusa. Now, talking about this primacy of emotion, um, there's another level about this painting that I can describe to you, but you have to see it in person to really experience it. This painting is over 16 feet tall and over 20 feet wide. So it takes an entire room in the Louvre. It's like right around the corner from the Mona Lisa or the next room. This is uh, the story of, please don't fall off your chair. This is a story of a shipwreck 
um, they were uh, shipwrecked. They, they were attached to lifeboats. And then the people in the lifeboats um, felt that they were being a, that it was a danger to them in the lifeboats. So they cut their lifeboat cords. And so this group of 147, I believe it was, um, soldiers, um, not soldiers, uh, uh, mariners and some other people were on this makeshift raft adrift at sea for 13 days. And in that 13 days, tragically, um, they resorted to all kinds of chaos, um, complete uh, breakdown of civil society and even cannibalism in 13 days. I personally think you probably could have fished, but um, this is uh, Jericho's description of that scene. It was quite um, a story told um, when this ship was finally rescued. So you're seeing both heroism, um, individual heroism on this ship. You're seeing complete torture. You're seeing utter despair and a riling sea. Um, and, and then on top of it, you make it this absolutely grand scale proportion so that if you walk up to this, I have heard people describe getting seasick standing in front of it because it has such this overwhelming emotion. Now, I personally can't look at this painting without seeing the barricades in Les Mis. <laughs> because to me, I think, especially in the, the Broadway uh, West End version of it, where you have um, the barricade building up as the center of the stage and in the very last scene, one of the soldiers it safely hung on, but flops himself over like this figure in the front foreground on the, on the right, uh, one leg hooked over and flopped over down uh, the barricade. So you have here that really intense emotion. You still have some of the classicism again in the figures, the composition. Delacroix actually felt um, like, Jericho. Jericho, excuse me, felt like he himself was a classicist, not a romanticist. Um, you can see where uh, that, that, that would be incorrect. <laughs> Um, and then we're going to take a couple of trips to a couple of landscapes to kind of see what happens in landscape paintings. And this is another picture, a painting we've, we've shown before. This is Caspar David Friedrich. It's titled Wanderer, uh, sometimes just shortened to Wanderer. But the full title is Wanderer Above a Sea of Fog. And really the sea of fog is as much as important as the wanderer in this painting. And in this painting, I find it extremely interesting that this is a painting that always gives historians, you, you can, it's, it's one of the tells. You can always tell a historian's individual, art historian's perspective on the world by their reaction to this painting. Many painters talk about it, and I think they might, does it say this down here? Yeah, in this particular, description, it says this is a metaphor for life as ominous journey into the unknown. I don't know how many of you think of this as ominous journey. I don't see, I, I see it more like awe in a good sense, drama. The world is an exciting place to explore. I don't see ominous because I don't read ominous in this character's stance. You know, it's not it's not what we saw on the raft of the Medusa. Maybe that's the <laughs> ominous journey. This uh, is, it seems a little uh, more benevolent uh, ex uh, exploration of, of the world. He should be flopped over the edge of the cliff with a look of horror on his face if it were Jericho. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or the, yeah, maybe. Um, so the, I always find, we always talk about that in, in several of these other chapters. We've talked about how, um, your reaction tells you as much about you as it does about the artist. And this is one of those cases, this is one of those tells where people have very different reactions to it. Um, and the next one I'm gonna show you is a beer stop. Yeah. Um, this is, I picked this one because I'm thinking most people don't know this beer stop. 
This one is from 1870 and it's called Storm in the Mountains. And I think this one also is a little bit in both camps. Um, Bierstadt is considered in the Romantics um, because of this awe-inspiring scenery that he does. He generally doesn't put humans, but you can always see, you know, deep in the foreground, there is human habitation. Uh, I don't know, farm. little farmhouse or little red farmhouse or something out there. But this is another one of those situations where you've got awe-inspiring drama that happens. Um, in this particular case, I find people react again two different ways. Is this this deep storm coming that's going to wipe away the valley? Or is this the drama of the weather that has passed and the sun is coming out? It kind of depends on your sense of life, how you take this painting. I think it's the latter, because I think that this contrast of this bright greeny yellow color and this dark purpley storm in the background, those two, I mean, it's, a, it's not only it's a contrast in atmosphere, but it's a contrast in color that's bringing your eye to the difference between these two and that both are very much part of the world. Now, um, Rob was saying, well, we were having a discussion about how does this happen in architecture? And we were talking earlier on about how architecture really creates the world for the humans to live in. Um, so when you've got humans that are going in this direction of drama and a, re a, a love of, of the medieval, in many cases, you end up um, with some pretty interesting architecture. Now this is technically a painting, but this is a ruin. This is a, another Caspar David Friedrich. This one's from 1809 and it's called Abbey Among the Oaks. So in architecture, when you have in, and in, when you have in literature, in music, in the visual arts, this turmoil, this toil, this drama happening, you all, you end up not having, it's not the same thing in architecture, but you, you, by creating this world for that experience, that man experience, you end up with a series of really interesting situations where you get people building ruins. And this is a painting of one of these, this one probably was a ruin, but you get this interest in recreating um, the older periods of time um, in a dramatic in coloration. Um, you get, uh, this is one that should be very famous to everybody. You get crazy King Ludwig's Neuschwanstein Castle. Um, this was 19th century romanticism in architecture. Um, this wasn't built because there was marauding hordes that needed to be protected. <laughs> this was built because this was the kind of world uh, that this king thought we should live in. In this particular case, he was a huge, huge fan of um, Wagner. So that kind of... Parsifal and Lohengrin and mm, these medieval things that Wagner did, yeah. You can see where that stands. Um, and another uh, maybe less Middle Ages kind of touch was the Royal Pavilion in Brighton. So this one, this is the element of eclectic, eclecticism that happened in architecture. Uh, it was this element of exotic. In this particular case, you have um, oh, probably four or five different um, cultures. You've got a little Moorish, you get a little Turkish, you get a little Indian, you get a little Chinese, you get some minarets thrown in for good measure. <laughs> um, the insides even more, it puts a whole new definition of the word opulent, uh, maybe with capital O. Uh, this is another example of this individual uh, patron who chose to do these completely unique individualistic kinds of structures. Now, if we bring it back down to, we can get rid of the share. If we bring it back down to, you know, daily architecture, you would see um, 
uh, this this made way a, more in the U.S. than elsewhere because the U.S. was really being built up at that time. You know, much of Europe, you the buildings were already built. You could renovate, but you can't really build brand new. So in the U.S., you'll find cities that were built with what was called the eclectic style. So you would get a Spanish house next to an Italianate house, next to a Greek revival house, next to um, a, a colonial revival house, next to a Georgian, to a federal. You, these are the kinds of things that you see across a lot of American cities. And that was, again, that sort of tie into the individualistic, the uniqueness of it all. So. Yeah the and the theatrical nature of it um so that gives you a little bit of a touch um maybe kind of a broader perspective of this is what's happening in literature and that's the sort of thing that was happening in the other arts uh and it's important to understand again i'll end with this that what ayn rand is talking about is romanticism in the intellect and the emotion tied together and if you go out to a museum and you look for romantic thing, romantic paintings, romantic period, or anything like that, you've got to remember that they're defining it in a different way. They're defining it by this grab bag of non-essentials that kind of gather it all together, but not necessarily pin it in place. Wow, Sh Sherry, you cheat <laughs> because because. A picture is worth thousand words. Exactly. And you actually select 10 pictures. They're actually worth a million words. There you go. You a, million words. a whole story with that. Okay. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do. Um, this is so incredible that I, I've tried to try to put this together. Let me just, I'm going to share the screen here. Um, so I'm trying to look at what, you know, mm. the, the range of what um, Rob, Joya, Marisa, and uh, Sherry, you, you, you guys have been talking about. And I, what I see is, is I'm, I'm a student of history mm -hmm. and all these eras are very different. So let's look at uh, eras of, you know, let's look at the following ones, the classical era, the Greek Greek Roman part, then there is a medieval part, then there is the enlightenment. And then you have you know, romanticism coming after that, and then there is Ayn Rand, and then there is modern times. So very roughly, I want to put it that way. And I want to look at this issue. I think the heart of the issue is volition versus non-volition non, non in this case. And I want to run through these various um, eras to see what their positions were on each of these things. What was their position on reason? What was their position on values? What was their position on emotions? What was their position on society as such? Okay, now this is a quick table that I've just put together in the last five minutes, okay, to try to summarize uh, everything. If you look at the medieval time, okay, uh, this is what is, a, what is the background for this discussion. There is a classical time before that. So in the medieval time, the way they looked at reasoning was that they re reason, they really did not care about reasoning. They were just focused on past ideas. It was reverence of past ideas. Mm -hmm. Just hold on to those ideas. That's all that they thought, thought about thinking. In terms of values, it was not about individual values. It was, so there was no individual values. The emotions were muted because there was no sense of an individual really caring about things. And the society was just focused on traditional society. This is how things are. So that is the background from which, you know, uh, all of this discussion starts. In enlightenment, what, and the way I see history is that at each stage, when somebody takes a step forward, many times they're focused on some, you know, that era is focused on one particular thing. It may not necessarily focus on everything because you can't really change everything. You know, human beings are complex beings and people learn stage by stage. So hallmark of enlightenment is the reasoning. Volition applied to reasoning, saying that don't take past ideas for granted, reason yourself. And as a result of it, you see all of these things. You see individual values. Now, the emotions are a little bit muted. 
whether you, you know, when you look at art, when you look at how they express themselves, they are muted, but they are very real. Mm -hmm. Only in the present, you know, looking at the emotions from our present context, they look muted. But when you look at them from, for example, the medieval context mm -hmm. of being kind of pr prim and proper and, you know, just remaining in your place, uh, you know, the things that founding fathers are saying, or people like Diderot and Voltaire are saying, those are very powerful, intense emotions with respect to that. So, um, and then I want to say something about society. I couldn't find a better word than America for it because before America, before enlightenment, people just took whatever society was there as given. You know, that we will always have monarchy. Let's hope that we have a benevolent monarch. That's pretty much as much that they thought about it. But the idea of saying, let us understand the volition of people, what people are doing, what kind of system do we design? This is like taking an active approach to, to the society. So that's kind of, that is a direct, America is a direct application of enlightenment to, to society on a massive scale. So these are all kind of values of enlightenment, but you can see that the, you know, from the present, looking at it, looking at it back from the present, the emotions look a little bit muted. Okay. Now, what, you know, people like Victor Hugo who come out of that, I want to put one more axis there of implicit and explicit. Okay. And I want to illustrate it with Victor Hugo. Now, Victor, Victor Hugo will not talk a lot about reasoning, but when you look at his work, he, reasoning permeates it. Mm -hmm. So implicitly, reasoning is there throughout his work. And what he adds is he glorifies the individual pursuit of values, that aspect, and has intense emotions uh, as a result of that. So the romantics who come immediately after people like Victor, you can see that in Beethoven. You know, Mozart is very much of kind of classical uh, person where it is a superb illustration of reasoning applied to music but does not have the element of volition mm -hmm. that Beethoven has. Beethoven brings that, you know, the, um, the volition into music with just tremendous fury and tremendous intensity of the kind never seen in music before. So that is very much kind of romanticism coming in intense emotions, but there is reasoning throughout the structures you know are magnificently crafted and you can look at his process of creation of those symphonies and it is all worked out with tremendous amount of thinking that is going be behind it so in that sense beethoven or victor hugo are kind of taking in both the enlightenment tradition and romanticism and showing something and that is the tradition that Ayn Rand is in. Both of them actually value the issue at, at the societal level of the structures. They respect the structures. Now, what you have afterwards is that people trying to pursue emotions by pushing back against reason, pushing back against society. So they are kind of anti-reason, anti-society, only pro individual values and intense emotions, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, as people are trying to map this, you know, magnificence, grandeur of human experience, they are grabbing on to pieces and pushing back against valid pieces. So kind of disintegrating uh, the integration in order to move forward on some axes. Um, and then some people are completely moving back on all axes as you know, together. So this I see as the dance that is being performed here. So I want to just uh, ask you guys for any thoughts, any comments. Yeah, I, I like to think about um, human history um, in the arts as sort of a pendulum swing mm -hmm. from reason to emotion and back and forth and because in both sides they don't realize that they're connected uh they think they're opposites so we keep swinging back and forth sometimes the most interesting things are right in the middle when they're getting close to connecting 
reason and emotion as one thing that as integrated. Um, and I think you can often see that you'll, you'll, you'll go from one pendulum swing to a cultural era to another back and forth. Um, frustrating. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, but one, one thing I would, I'd recommend to people, actually, if you want to get a sense for this idea of the pendulum swinging from emotion, reason to emotion, uh, a good little document on that is the Jane Austen novel, Sense and Sensibility. Oh, because sense is in the mean, it means mm -hmm. not like good sense or horse sense, but it means sen sensation. It means the senses. And so it refers to emotion and sensibility refers to reason. So emotion versus reason is very much the theme there. Uh, if you don't want to read the whole book, there's a very good movie version that was done with uh, Emma Thompson and uh, Kate Winslet in the 90s mm -hmm. um, that captures, is a very good script uh, by Emma Thompson, actually, that captures the essence of the novel very nicely. And it's this idea of, uh, and it's, it's really a theme throughout all of Jane Austen's novels that you have this sort of traditional order of society where marriage is about position and wealth and status. And then this new romantic notion where it's about love and passion and very more so in any of, uh, that's a theme in all of her novels is trying to find this way of integrating those two things. And you know, the happy endings always happen when they, the main character gets both things at the same time. Uh, but they're brought into more intense conflict, I think, in Sense and Sensibility than the other novels. And it gives you a sense of this idea of this, this uh, 18th century attitude of, well, life should be about order and regularity and using your, your reason to, um, to regulate your emotions versus this romanticism coming in of the younger sister uh, who gets swept up in the romanticism of this uh, affair with a guy who turns out, of course, to be a cad. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, being swept up in the romanticism of giving, you know, uh, uh, being swept up in your passions. And they were really wrestling with that because that was a, you know, early 19th mm -hmm. century was that transitional era. Excellent. Um, Maritza or Joya, do you have any comments? Yeah, I, I want to add, a, I, I'm curious the extent to which it's a pendulum or are we learning along the way and progressing? Mm. Is it maybe even more, can it be more of a spiral or can we make it more of a spiral? I'm curious to even hear how Srikant thinks that fits onto his model that he created, which I really like. Mm. Um, no, I think, I, I do think that uh, the, the pendulum uh, is a very good way of thinking about it because what happens is that there is like a cause and effect and you know, there is, um, and what happens is that part of it is it's like form and function issue, that there is a function that creates a form and then the form gets older and the function moves along. And then there is a focus on function again and that remakes the form again. So it is the hmm. cycling between form and function. So that is one way of, of thinking about it. Uh, the other way of thinking about it is that you can, take certain things as given, like for example, at a given point of time in history, some things is a, some, there are some kind of, um, what shall I say, screaming needs that somebody sees that, okay, emotions, you know, individuals are not able to express emotions. Let me be the champion of that and do that. And in so doing, they are, pushing back some things which are kind of anti-emotion, which had some basis in reason before. But in trying to champion that, you go a little too far. And then people who stand on the shoulders of that try to take that in, in order to bring back the reason, kind of to reintegrate the thing. So partly it is a spiral. You know, it is a spiral, it's going, so think about it as a pendulum is like this, but it's actually a spiral like this. So it is going this way and that way, but there is a going, at the same time, spiral is not determined in the sense that it's not that you would always spiral up. You can always spiral down too. <laughs> there are people spiraling up and there are people spiraling down. And this motion, reason and emotion motion is this way motion. And then there is the up down motion and then there is a kind of circular motion because it takes time to, yeah. to do all of this. So that's how I think. Well, well, I would say that Ayn Rand is trying to create that next level of the spiral by saying, let's, let's combine romanticism and enlightenment ideas. Let's combine reason and emotion and find a way to integrate them together. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And it does take me, it's not a mechanical process. It takes mm -hmm. tremendous work of thought. I mean, the best example I see is Beethoven or Victor Hugo. It's like, you know, you look at their personality, you look at their life, you look at what was there before them and what they did. And it is a giant leap. It is a leap. It is an act of tremendous integration, not at a, at a cultural level of somebody. And that's what Ayn Rand is trying to do. Ayn Rand in many ways is trying to point, you know, in, in this Romantic Manifesto, she talks about there was a time, you know, Belle Epoque time, which had this feel for it. The culture had a feel for it. Okay. So you're trying to bring that back. But, you know, it is on the shoulders of people like Hugo or Beethoven that things move forward because the integration that they produce is so much about what was done before that it sets a new standard. After that, many people unfortunately try to copy them. Okay. And what they produce is actually lower than what they did. They claim in their words that they are doing something like Beethoven or Hugo. Okay. And they would actually talk very, very strongly and, you know, against people trying to defend Hugo or Beethoven, but what they are producing is much, 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 much lower than that. So, and this is the issue of sense of life versus explicit philosophy. Um, what these people have, people like Beethoven or Hugo, is that they have a sense of life, which is at a very high level, and they have enough explicitness to carry it out. Anybody else? All right, um, so no, go ahead, Marisa. Just, just really quickly, I want to say what I, I love about the concept of um, viewing the um, items you pulled out of viewing the mass of pendulum is the, it speaks to the iterative process of, um, and you know, um, Joya spoke about this a little bit earlier about rebirth, you know, this chapter is a call to the, the need for a rebirth as it were. And, and I, I really like the concept of the swinging pendulum because it points to us that you know, we, we need to revisit certain things, but in a slightly different way. And I like what you were, what you were just, I feel like you were just like in my mind painting that picture there for me, because as you go back, it's never, it's never on the same exact path. It's going to be slightly different, but the motion is necessary. If the pendulum stops, yeah. well, we're all in trouble. Yes. And I feel like that's kind of what's being said here. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, I just want to add one thing is that this pendulum actually goes on in multiple dimensions. So people will bemoan the fact that I look at the museums and all the, all the exhibits are so terrible, but no, no, no. It has actually moved somewhere else. The actual real movement is happening in things like movies and, you know, maybe video games or all kinds of other places. And it's the human experience and it's happening in a, mm -hmm brought me currently today, like people, you know, be more about the state of art, but you have to realize that the art is being produced and consumed in so many different media. And there are some incredible things happening in places where, um, which is not considered art, but it is art. Mm -hmm. And that is all part of the story. And this is all kind of working, working together. So people who are kind of quote unquote, high, high end art, they are holding on to something which is actually of the past. And they are trying to preserve a very narrow domain. Um, and they are being completely overtaken by stuff outside. All right, uh, folks, uh, this, is the, I, this is my favorite discussion so far. So this is, and uh, I say it every time, but this, this is truly, I mean, it's just amazing. Okay, folks, so I'm gonna open it up for uh, Q and A's. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in Zoom. Keep your questions very brief at this time. And we will go ahead uh, and do breakout rooms after that. And when you come back, we will get to talk about uh, your takeaways as well. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and you can go ahead and say, you know, uh, line up for interviews. Uh, not interviews, sorry, <laughs> questions. Uh, Lloyd followed by Joe. Lloyd. Great, great presentations from everybody. Really, really enjoyed them very much. Um, just wanted to say that, do you think Ayn Rand made a, um, made a bad choice to call her thinking romanticism 
because that creates confusion. If you're if you're synthesizing two things, don't name it one of the things that you're trying to synthesize because you're trying to create something new. Excellent question. Um, would anybody like to respond? Um, I'll jump in for just a second here. I, I think it was purposefully done because she wanted to bring up the image of romanticism as it existed and then to reshape it. And that's kind of how I viewed it. Yeah, I, I would also point out this is the same lady who wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. And <laughs> so she, she had a, a certain track record. She had a certain track record of, of even somewhat combatively trying to say, I'm going to take a term and I'm going to reclaim it. Yeah. You know, no matter what everybody else think it, thinks it means, I'm going to reclaim it for what I, for what I think it should mean. Wonderful. Uh, next up is uh, Joe. Um, so yeah, fantastic presentation. There's like a ton of notes. But that one thing that you just said, Shrikant, at the end there, uh, so yeah, it's towards you is the there's advancements being made in art that aren't necessarily considered an art today. Like, could you expand on that a little bit so sure. that I have a better? Sure. I mean, uh, one. I mean, this is a general point about today's culture. There are things, you know when you look at the times of the past, you know, I, I study history, you look at things in the past, the number of people and number of places where these things are going on is very small. It's a very small number of people in small number of places. Now we have 8 billion people, so sheer number. Secondly, the percentage of them who are able to do something like this, both produce and consume is through the roof. So we're talking about thousand times, 10,000 times, 100,000 times before, okay? Secondly, everybody is engaged in their life in a self-directed way pursuing their values. And this is ultimately, this is all about individuals volitionally pursuing their values and finding what they need and creating what they need. And they do it in all kinds of forms. So to give you just one example is video games, okay? Their video game industry now is bigger than the movie industry, much bigger, okay? And the amount of art that is being produced there is completely dwarfs all the quote unquote art in the museum, okay? Same thing with another classic example is movies, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like people talk about music, how the, classical music today that is being produced is terrible, but the music has moved along. Mm -hmm. They have, you know, there is, it, most of the music that is being consumed is there in the pop music world and in places like music, you know, movie scores. Movie scores in particular mm -hmm. are particularly powerful because they have to integrate and do justice to this form of art, which is movie, which is an integrative form. And those there are music scores and people producing music for movies, which actually capture the lead motive of the entire movie mm -hmm. and then different parts of the movie. So that's a, that's, a, that's a tremendous feat. And that's just being done in plain sight. And people keep saying, oh, the music is going down the drain. No, no, no. Yeah, you I just wanna, are I looking in the wrong place. So go ahead. Uh, I'll second that street concept. The, the greatest living composer is John Williams. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's not the only movie composer. You know, you've Oh, got... no, no. But I mean, you have, in terms of the greatest uh, amount of work that he's done. Yeah. And as a, as I would say, a romantic composer, mm -hmm. a modern romantic composer, John Williams would be the greatest. Yeah. And the same thing would apply to literature. You know, most of the things being read are being done in blogs you know, are, are, are distributed. So it's like, it's the, the whole thing is, is very, you know, it's I, much larger. Go ahead. I want to jump in and say, I think video games is a great example of this new pendulum swing for romanticism and specifically Ayn Rand's idea of what romanticism is, that it's all about volition. Video games is this whole new medium where they create the universe for you and you actually get to be the character and use your volition to navigate that universe. So it, it is sort of a, the, the new dimension for thinking about uh, you know, volition in terms of a, a recreated world. Wonderful. Next up is uh, Jonathan. Jonathan, go ahead. 
Thank you, Shukant. Uh, I loved the presentation today and I loved the examples as well because I don't have um, necessarily as much of knowledge about all these different forms and what they look like. Um, so maybe you, you mentioned this, Rob, but I, I'm not clear on it. Is is the what, what this is to anyone on the panel? What was the was where did romanticism come from? How did you suddenly get this big shift in like what people painted? Is there anything we know like as to what what might have indicated what caused it or anything like that? One of the issues. Do you want to talk about yeah. that? Well, yeah, part of it was it was an understandable reaction against a so the, the worst thing you can do to a good idea is to make it into a dogma. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's what really happened in the classical period. Yeah. So I actually did. I, I have a podcast that I do called Salon of the Refused, and it's named after an event that happened in, in the art world. It's kind of an art history joke. Uh, the Salon of the Refused. So the Paris, in Paris, in the, in the French art establishment had these things called salons where you have this giant, uh, it was a, a large exhibit where the top people in the art world in, in, in France would uh, be the jury who would select you know, they, they would select which uh, works of art were allowed into this big exhibit. It's a big annual exhibit. And they'd allow, they select which art works were allowed in, and then they would give a prize to the top ones in different categories. And it was something that, you know, it, it would make your career if you were selected. You say, I could exhibit it in the Paris Salon of 1843. That would establish you as somebody in the art world. And if you won, you know, the top prize, then that would make your career. You know, you were, you were anointed as a great artist. Uh, but what happened is it became very stilted and you know you had in the other classes that you had this all these different rules and you had a strict hierarchy where land you know uh, uh, still life was here and landscape painting was here and history painting was at the top and you, you weren't considered fully serious if you didn't do that and you also had a tremendous amount of imitation so in the this all came to a head in the Paris Salon of 1863 and what happened is that there, a huge number of works were refused from the Paris Salon, from, from the 1863 Salon. And there was a general rebellion that, you know, the, the salons were hidebound, they were old fashioned, they were uh, dogmatic, they were refusing all these worthy works. And that, so what happened is that Napoleon III, who was the emperor of France at the time, said, Hell, can I, who am I to uh, oppose the will of the people? I'm going to allow another uh, exhibit called the Salon of the Refused, <laughs> where these other works will be allowed to be uh, displayed. And the interesting thing is that the, the works in the Salon of the Refused ended up being far more influential uh, over the long run than the ones in the official Salon. So you know, it was a, a lot of the early Impressionists. So um, people like Courbet and, and uh, yeah. Whistler and Manet and, and you know, all these early Impressionists. And I don't particularly care for the early Impressionists that much, the Impressionists that much. I don't think that's the great direction in art, but to understand it in this context, the existing academic school had become so rote and imitative and uh, um, uh, uncreative that it was right for somebody to come along and do something different just to create a rebellion, just to, you know, just, and it was interesting just because it was different and it wasn't the same thing you'd seen a bunch of times before. Mm -hmm. So the, the, actually the winning uh, painting in the official salon uh, of 1863 was this thing called the birth of Venus and you know it's it's cherubs and it's all just you know it's stuff you you know it, it's cherubs in 1863 and not in 1663 it's like you know it's stuff that's been around and done and redone and overdone uh, over a period of hundreds of years and you know it, it fits it ticks off all the boxes on the official rules while being completely uncreative and uh, having uh, uh, no real, capturing nothing that's really vital and new that people needed. And so there was, I think that by becoming a dogma, the sort of existing classicist or academic style of painting and, and of art became rife for a challenge from anything that was opposed to it, anything that was new and different and seemed to have more vitality and creativity and creativity and originality to it. Um. I want to add another answer that in a different way, really. Okay. Um, and it's really a lot of what Ayn Rand wrote this book for. Um, these things happen repeatedly throughout history because we humans are yearning for something more, and especially in art. Um, we because our sense of life is is looking for that that um, 
that image, that example um, of what our lives could be. And when, um, when art is becoming dulled and like a pattern, a repeated pattern, um, that's a situation that's really, really ripe for someone to come in and make this offering of a, a different way of looking at things. And people flock to it because it, it, it gives them that sense of life feel. Excellent. Um, so, I mean, one of the patterns that I see is that, you know, like whenever something gets stale, something becomes a dogma, right? I'm, I'm, I always, Sherry, I always think of this in terms of uh, form and function. Yeah. So it's like form has been created and the form is becoming stale, okay? Now, there are two ways approach, uh, two things you can approach. There are people who um, rebel against that form and actually try to end up destroying the function behind that too. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who reconnect with the function and then create a form. And that's kind of either you're building it or you're just, so the same, same um, feeling of saying this form is actually stifling me. There are two, one is that I'm going to take a hammer to it and destroy it. And along with it myself, or you are going to do the work, which, and the thing is it is easy. I mean, that's another question of, you know, effort. It is easy to destroy something. It is much harder to create something that you need that is of the next level. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's what is going on. A fantastic discussion, folks. So we're going to do a, a 20 minute uh, breakout rooms mm -hmm. and then we'll come back to share our takeaways. And then we're going to uh, look at all the points that come in and then we're going to talk about it, starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back folks, welcome back. All right, so it's time for takeaways. Uh, what did you learn from the meetup? Any questions that you have? Get between one to two minutes to put your takeaways and questions on the table, and then we'll be discussing it. And want to let you know that immediately after this, we're going to be doing almost like a study group or questions for people who have been reading or who have read Romantic Manifesto. And Jonathan is the question master. He has already come up with, a, he's, he's been coming up with incredible questions and he's compiled all of them. Um, and we will be talking about, you know, hey, Joya, uh, we'll be talking about the questions immediately after this. And these those questions can be on any part of Romantic Manifesto, but the requirement for participating uh, actively in, in that is to have read uh, romantic manifesto, but you're willing, you know, you're uh, more than welcome to uh, to just listen uh, to that. So now it's time for takeaways. Uh, if you'd like to share your takeaways, go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat. And uh, so this is going to be voluntary. And then you can also put a question on the table if you want. Jyoti, you're first. Go ahead. Okay, I was actually getting ready to leave that I got into the breakup room and Jora, she started to, I mean, she asked me to give the takeaway and then I could leave. She made the whole thing so interesting that I'm still here. <laughs> uh, right. I mean, she generated <laughs> questions and then Anne and uh, Kevin, they joined in and I said, oh, I have to walk my dog, I have to walk my dog and he's sitting here and barking. <laughs> but what I have to say is, um, and I will say this and leave, I have not read the book. I'm good. And for once, I will tell Shrikant, I'm speechless. <laughs> Sometimes he gets impatient with me. <laughs> I learned a lot. I had literal meaning about the romanticism. And I didn't uh, understand that romanticism is like a one label under which sub-labels uh, are attached your values, your morals, like your time, the social progress, the compassion, the love, and what have you. So Joyda had brought up La Miserable, which I had watched a couple of times, 
And once we started to talk about drugs, I think everything became crystal, uh, crystal clear to me. So I won't speak too much now. All I have to say is the presentation was just excellent. It was wonderful. And for the first time in my life, I know what romanticism is. <laughs> I'm a little bit literate today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye, Jyoti. Bye. Uh, bye. Uh, next up is Lloyd, Jonathan, and Joe. Lloyd. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, Maritza did a great job, as, uh, as always, uh, giving us a lot of food for thought, a lot to talk about. Um, and she acknowledged that her specialty is more liter literature than uh, maybe art. So, you know, everybody has their different uh, specialties. Um, My group was challenging me on a lot of <laughs> art questions. <laughs> <laughs> but you're learning stuff, so uh, that's good, too. Um, but uh, I was just going to say, I... I Compared to the other chapters, I found this chapter uh, a bit of a muddle. And I think that, like I said, I think this book suffers because it wasn't written straight away as a whole. You know, there's different essays and she's jumping in at different points, what she was trying to say for the Objectivist magazine. So I didn't get any of the clarity that was provided by the panel of Ayn Rand doing the synthesis of the, you know, romanticism and the enlightenment. And that, that was very, uh, very illuminating, but, you know, reading it, it was a model. I didn't get any of that. I'm trying to, you know, just a simple sentence. I'm trying to synthesize this from romanticism and this from the enlightenment. That would have made it a lot easier. But again, because these are essays and she's jumping in at different points and trying to emphasize different things, doesn't have the coherence that you would have if you read a straight up book written as a whole. So this panel is crucial because I don't know what the hell she's talking about half the time in this chapter. All right, Rod, Lloyd, I invite you to go ahead and write the book. Uh, next up is uh, Jonathan, Joe and Brendan. Jonathan. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so this, uh, this conversation was amazing. I really like that Rob started with explaining how like the connections between enlightenment and the el specific elements of romanticism. So I've got a bit more clarity around that. And then obviously Sherry's examples, um, Maritza's examples from uh, Les Miserables and then Joya giving like specific romanticists kind of has helped me. It was when I read this, some of the, I read some of the essay, I didn't read all of it. I, I like, like Lloyd, I found it kind of hard to, cause I have no firsthand experience of some of these authors. I'm just it's a bit like, I, I this is what she's saying. It kind of makes sense, but it's hard for me to put together. But this conversation has helped me get a bit more clear on it. So thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. I just want to say, I mean, the thing is that, uh, you know, whenever somebody is producing something work like this, it always goes uh, in this format where people are trying, you know, she's trying to kind of, you know, in these essays that she wrote, she's trying to make sense of this, what has happened to art. You know, she's looking at the entire realm of art and trying to make it, um, trying to make it accessible, trying to figure out what is going on. And uh, that's what was produced in the book format. Now, the advantage that uh, Rob, Sherry, um, Marisa, Joya, and I have is that we are sh standing on the shoulders. So we have, we have not only listened to her and then thought about it ourselves, connected it to to you know made the connections and that's what any individual you know i the thing is i'm a little bit flippant uh when when i respond to you know these kind of things because i think that each person who each reader needs to do that needs to kind of take in everything no matter what book they are reading and put the picture together themselves so in that sense uh you know partly it is the fact that she provided a good foundation and partly is all of us have been kind of working on it for a period of time, trying to connect it. And so we are able to express it far more clearly, just like she was able to express the heart of romanticism far more clearly than what the people from enlightenment or romanticism could do, where they could not even see the connections between them. 
uh, because she stood on the shoulder, she was able to do that. So I think I think that's kind of a natural progression. You know, if you stand on somebody's shoulders, you better see see further. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're kind of draping on the shoulders and looking at the ground instead. So uh, next up is uh, Joe, Brandon, and Rupali. Joe. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to expand just slightly on what everybody has already said because the idea of romanticism and classical. Uh, and I was understanding the difference clearly now. So that was something that was really important for me. But I also got an idea of where we are today and where we're actually headed with art. And that was a very important uh, revelation for me. And we had a couple of examples that we talked about with the, the use of music in movies was the one you know, you'd given and then we expanded upon that in, in, in the breakout room. But that really kind of crystallized and kind of gave me an idea of where art is today and then what where can i start looking to see it and it allowed me to backtrack and understand even more so i think I, you know it's really kind of providing me with new insights and all the panelists have uh, provided it you know really good examples that made that very clear today so uh my you know extend my appreciation to everyone um and uh thank you thanks joe uh, next up is Brendan, followed by Rupali. Brendan. Hi, thanks, everyone. This was fantastic. Uh, I love this chapter. It was great to hear everyone really dive into it, give all the additional details, talking about classicism and romanticism, and also talking about where art's going. And it had me thinking about the Romantic Manifesto. I love just how explicit it is about what romanticism is, uh, giving all the detailed examples. Uh, with literature especially, since I'm more literary. And it made me wonder, and I wonder if anyone knows, what kind of influence this book may or may not have had on the culture as a whole. Because I see different novelists, sometimes get to talk with them, or screenwriters, and if they're romantic, seem romantic explicitly, or sometimes even describe themselves as romantic, and then they'll describe certain things about their processes. And even if not using the exact same words, it definitely makes me think back to the Romantic Manifesto. I'm wondering if that's implicit, explicit, if anyone else has written similar things since then. Excellent. I think that's that's definitely a question that we would ask at the end, end of this round. Uh, so folks, uh, if you want to share your takeaways, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Next up is Rupali. Rupali, go ahead. So uh, you said it's time for takeaways and I said, what? <laughs> I was just enjoying this. <laughs> conversation and I'm just so um, sad that it's coming to an end. So anyhow. Uh, Rupali, it's not coming to an end. What are you talking about? We're, we're going to finish this one. Then we're going to deal with all the questions. If you put lots of questions, we are going to deal with them. Then we are going to do the intensive study of all the concepts and you can bring in all these questions back. So go ahead, Rupali. And we're going to be coming back week after week. So go ahead. Well, I think as jo Joya had mentioned earlier, this is like the central chapter, literally figuratively too. It's in the cent like right midpoint in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I really like the way she uh, compared and contrasted the romanticism versus naturalis uh, naturalism. And it really very in a concrete form brought to me, you know, what romanticism is. The other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is uh, she she talks about the characters, um, you know, the uh, examples of literature where the there's perfect integration of theme and plot, and the characters achieve, uh, you know, they are with superlative virtuosity, and so, so that that um, those examples larger than life characters, you know, are inspiring for humans, and it's. Um, I think in religion, they use they, the, the superlative was probably God, right? You achieve those qualities. So at least in uh, Jainism, that is true. Uh, but that's so far away from what we live in the day-to-day -day life. And to have real characters, uh, although these are abstractions, to know that this is possible in this practical physical world, uh, I think is um, a good, kind of a moral or lesson from these books. Um, the other thing that is confusing for me is her talk about altruism, right? And 
as humans. And these characters, they are um, not only dealing with their uh, own conflicts or moral values, but there's also a part of them that, that live in the society. And so society works with people together. And so, uh, yes, we're talking about the individual here, but the individual is part of the society. So if we don't have that element of altruism, um, how, how do we fit in? And this is something that I kind of wonder even with students that I work with, you know, uh, if we are doing a community service um, to talk about serving as opposed to giving out of pity or giving out of sympathy. And she talks about with altruism as the criterion for value and virtue, it is impossible to create an image of man at his best. And I have to come to terms with that. So just thinking about, um, you know, how, how we fit in as uh, an individual within a society. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so we'll definitely uh, look at that. So there are two large things that have come so far. You know, Brendan has talked about what is the impact of her work um, since that, since the time it was published, and then the question about kind of self and others. How, how does that work? Uh, next up is Alex. Alex, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. Hi, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just want to say that thank you so much for uh, this lecture, this uh, discussion about uh, on this topic. It's uh, it's something that not, I think more people should be uh, should look at, and uh, it, it, and I actually see that see this as a tool for that could be used in many many forms. Uh, maybe she was uh, referring mostly to literature, but definitely. Um, you know, this is a this could be a, a, a guideline for uh, people who are doing you know things on their own uh, to creating their own style of things um, and, and to voice their form their own opinions. I think during the breakout room, uh, um, one of the um, I think it was Ru RuPaul. Uh, she mentioned that it was actually very would be very good for children. You know, but but. But above all, everything is, nothing is perfect. And I'm sure this, there are uh, 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 deficits in, in her theory on her own way of, of uh, uh, romanticism. And, uh, you know, we, I, I think for me, you know, I take away from this uh, lecture, from this discussion, um, what I think it would be useful for me uh, uh, for the things I would do in life, uh, but probably not not be able to do everything with it. But I do. But I actually, you know, uh, uh, see this as, as a tool for uh, for 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 you know, if you try to do some things, it's it's very useful. And I learn. I really learned quite a lot from so many people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if there is anybody else who would like to share their takeaways, you're welcome to do that. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, uh, let me go ahead and uh, then you know bring up the two issues. And I also want to point out. Uh, I want to ask um, Rob about the presentation on style. I think that's we have to we have to do it at some point. So we'll, oh, yeah. we'll do that. Um, so first question is about romanticism today. You know, since she wrote these essays. What has happened to the romanticism in the culture? Anybody, uh, any of the panelists, go ahead. One of the things I want to do is kick that down the can a little bit because in about four weeks, we're going to be talking about her introduction in 93. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point at which I want to talk a lot about the impact of Les Miserables because you know, that it made Victor Hugo a household name again. Mm -hmm. I think that had a lingering cultural impact. But I also think that a lot of the you know, a lot of the discoveries of how to write a plot and how to write a romantic plot. Uh, a lot of that actually has been absorbed in Hollywood and it's there and they use it when they feel like they want to. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they ignore, of course, they do ignore it all the time as well. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, when you talk about somebody's 
was writing, talking about uh, a particular movie that came out recently and talked about how, oh, this is just textbook. And there actually are textbooks out there, you know, how, how they went from the second act to the third act, the transition was just textbook. And, you know, there is, there are textbooks out there that will give you how to structure a plot in a way to build up to a satisfying climax and then resolve it. So a lot of that, this, how to make a plot has been learned. Um, and somebody mentioned earlier about, uh, well, one of the, uh, the odd recommendation to give people is there's a website called TV Tropes. Do you have to do a really weird odd recommendation every week? Yes, I have to have odd recommendation. <laughs> there's a website called tvtropes.com or .org, I can't remember. <laughs> But it's done by a bunch of TV fans who they came up with like this list of various kind of what they call tropes or it, it, trope is not exactly the same thing as a cliche. It's like a standard plot or characterization device or a, a standard way of building a plot or a character. And it was sort of put together to say, well, these aren't necessarily cliches. They can become cliches if you do them in a lazy way. And the whole challenge is to be able to do this, you know, it's a, if you know all these all these different ways of building a plot and different ways of making a character, the challenge is to do it in a stand in that in that way that's been identified, but with enough originality that it seems new, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, not just to be borrowing pieces of you know ripping off what came before. So I think a lot of good stuff has been done. We live in the era of peak television, uh, where you know every streaming service has is producing you know a half a dozen. Uh, original shows. So there actually is a fair bit of good stuff out there. But I think, go back to Srikanth's point, it's become so stratified and varied and, and diffuse that there's a lot of good stuff being done and a lot of terrible stuff being done. And it's not just, you know, there are three channels on the TV and there's whatever's there. Excellent. Um, oh, oh, sorry. I was going to just jump in and say really quickly that our next chapter is the aesthetic vacuum of our age. That's what the chapter is called. Um, but interestingly, I don't think we live in the same age as Ayn Rand anymore all these decades later. So I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion about this question next week, even yeah. as we discuss what is the aesthetic status of the uh, 2020s. Yeah. yeah. But the well, one thing I want to say is that to produce a great work of art takes a lot. Um, actually people who kind of were uh, really enthralled by Ayn Rand's conception of romanticism and tried to produce art based on that, because of that, never really got anywhere because it was like a very pale reflection which purports to be art, but it doesn't have the moving power at all. Um, and I've seen this in both visual arts and in um, literature, uh, but there are people in other genres, like for example, science fiction, there would be elements. Um, and so you have to look for it. It could be in comic books, there would be elements. And so you have to kind of look for it, look, look for kind of greatness wherever, wherever you can find it. And there is a lot of places uh, to look. Now I want to take up uh, Rupali's question, but I want to expand the question. I want to bring back my uh, my little table here. So, oh, just a second. I don't think it worked. Give me a second. Sorry about that. Okay, just give me a second. I'm having a problem with the windows here. While Srikant struggles with yes. that, um, I'll just jump on, uh, add on to what Joya was saying about our next chapter. Um, while you're reading it, I think we should, uh, this, I don't know if it, all you know this, but Srikant has this habit of always jumping to the very end of the book. So I want you all to jump to the very end of this chapter. The very last line says November, 1962. So before you read it, make sure you read that line and then go back to the beginning of the chapter and read it. This is the only time I agree with Srikant's idea that you always read the end and then you read the beginning. The rest of the time, he's just wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, is it, what, what is it showing? Is it, it's showing uh, that- Salon of the Refused, is it, what is it showing? No, I see a blank screen. Blank, see screen. A blank screen. Okay, I don't know what has happened to my share screen. Give me a second. 
I do want to share it and let me try one last time here. This one and share. Nope, it's not working for some reason. Okay. Is something you want us to share? Um, no, that's fine. I'm, I'm going to go, uh, go ahead and talk about it. Okay. Um, all right. So let's look at this question of self versus society and how that question has been dealt with across all these ages. See, this is one powerful thing about art that you can take an issue like this. What is the relationship between an individual and society? And just run through all the periods, look at their art and look at the view that was presented. Okay, so look at the medieval times. Medieval times, individual doesn't count at all. It is a society that counts. This is true of most traditional societies as well. You know, society is the ideal and the individual is kind of part of the family, part of the culture, and they just kowtow to whatever it is that society hands to them. So that is the base from which you're starting. In enlightenment time, you have the recognition of the value of the individual, that individual can think firstly, and that's like the root part, you know, because an individual can think and figure out things about the world and is able, so that's one part, you know, that is kind of beginning of the science revolution, beginning um, of enlightenment. And then there is the political consequences of it, like in America, where instead of depending on a traditional society that has already been created, with a certain hierarchy and you trying to, individual's job is to just fit into that. The ability of individuals to create a system, to, to meet the requirements of individuals. So the vision of Jefferson of saying that individual has right to life, liberty and pursuit of happiness and governments are created to protect those rights. So you develop the system to protect. That's turning the entire view of individual versus society on its head uh, and just reversing the, the causality over there. Um, so that, and you can see that in enlightenment in uh, romanticism, the kind of reaction to enlightenment kind of tries to almost worship the emotions of an individual to the detriment of individuals operating in a larger context of their life, their thought, their social interactions. So it is, it's a very different kind of individualism based on emotionalism. And then you have somebody like Ayn Rand, which is bringing together both those things. So in the, you know, Ayn Rand certainly holds the sanctity, the sacredness of an individual. At the same time, she knows that it is necessary to come up with win-win interactions with others according to certain principles to live life well. So those those things. So so the question, um, Rob, you had you were saying something? Oh no, I was oh, okay. So um so I think this issue, so the question is, how does this issue show up in art? So this is an issue in philosophy of individual, how, you know, what system allows for full expression of individual and how does it interact with the fact that we have so much to gain by acting, you know, by cooperating with people and we are social beings that in order to achieve the scale of life that we need, that we want, we need to cooperate with others to do that. So how is it done in philosophy and how is it reflected in art? Rob. Uh, so I just wanted to also mention that I, when Ayn Rand uses the term altruism, she uses it in a very specific sense, mm -hmm. which is also the sense used by the guy who invented the term altruism. So we think of, we would take altruism for granted as a general term and the way people generally use it is meaning being nice to other people, right? And uh, I saw a psychiatry, psychology paper talking about altruism and described it as anything intended for the benefit of another person, which that's not what altruism meant in its original sense or its 
strict philosophic sense. So the term was coined by uh, a French philosopher named Auguste Comte in roughly 1840-ish. Uh, and it literally meant otherism. And it meant specifically the idea that you have no function in life except to uh, act for the good, for the sake of others. To, uh, to uh, Viva pour autrui is the phrase in French, to live for others so that you, you know, your desires, your goals, your well-being are unimportant. And the only thing that's important and the sole ruling principle of your life should be your sacrificing of your, well, your well-being for the sake of others, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a total philosophy of self-immolation, of viewing the self as a, just a cell in the collective. And he was very much a hardcore collectivist. It's, a, it's like Marxism before. It's, it's a more philosophically pure form of, of, of Marxist Soviet East Bloc collectivism. Uh, it's the origin of all that. So when she talks about altruism, she's talking about it in that sense. So it's not just cooperating with others or working with others or being nice to others. It's specifically the idea that you have no right to your own well-being and your own, uh, um, uh, to your own goals or values you exist purely to serve, purely for the function of serving other people. And it, it creates that sort of uh, uh, paradox, which was, uh, I think, stated by W.H. Auden, which is, if, if we're put on earth to serve others, what are the others here for? <laughs> uh, and Ayn Rand answered that in The Fountainhead, where she has Ellsworth Tui say, well, you know, how it's going to work is everybody has no thought except to serve his, the person next to him who has no thought except to serve the next person next to him. Etc. 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 And you know, all all sacrifice and none profit. I just want to concretize that really quickly and say it's always helpful for me to remember that a huge part of Ayn Rand's story was that she grew up in and escaped Soviet Russia, and that's the morality that she's she's really trying to rebel against and warn us against. Um, you know, that view of the state is all, and the individual is just to be self-immolated for the sake of the state. <laughs> I wanted to also jump in here for a second and um, well, I'm going to shamelessly um, put out the suggestion, Shrikant, that perhaps our next uh, Ayn Rand text to tackle would be the um, virtue of selfishness. It's one of my absolute favorites um, and it's Lloyd, I, I apologize, to yet another term that she takes and redefines instead of giving, instead of coming up with a new term. But I, I say that because that's what came to mind with um, Rupali's question is that she's not saying don't do anything for other people. She's saying, and, and she does specify when she's speaking of selfishness, she's saying the best way to help your community is to improve yourself. And that's what I'm hearing. So, you know, I don't know if I'm an expert, but that's what I hear her say. And, and the, that would be one of the things that I, that draw me most to different philosophers is philosophers who are saying that because I, I find that that just resonates to me. And it's, it, it's like the concept of the mask on an airplane. You guys have all, um, well, if any of you have not flown, when you get on a plane, they always tell you in the event of an emergency and the masks come down, which means the oxygen in the plane has been compromised first, put on your mask and then turn and put the mask on for your child. And that seems anathema, like it seems, wait, no, the child is helpless. I need to put on the child. But if you fail to ensure that you have enough oxygen, then you've doomed both yourself and the child, right? Mm -hmm. So I feel like that is what Ayn Rand is telling us when she says it's, you, you cannot be altruistic. You have to focus on yourself. And in so doing, you will improve the lives of those around you. Right, uh, Rupali, you have a follow-up or you have? No, I think uh, all of these uh, discussions were very um, helpful in clarifying the thought. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, folks, so this is the end of the main part of today's uh, lecture or today's discussion on romanticism. What is romanticism? So now we're going to go to the second part, which is going to be on Q&A. Uh, 